Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to our conference. In fact, we have three conferences today that we've decided to hold all together. Um, I want to welcome you very much to what is our second online conference. You know, pandemic makes you very um, uh, adventurous and you're developing all sorts of new skills that you never knew you had. But um, today we will look in much, much more detail at the whole area of freedom, security and justice. And we'll have a lot of interesting speakers, a lot of interesting chairs and discussions with us. And tomorrow we'll be looking in more detail at the whole area of EU counterterrorism and counterterrorism more generally. And then on Wednesday, we'll be looking uh, a lot more into EU resilient and hybrid warfare. Now, today and in fact, the next three days is the culmination of three Jomone projects that we received last year. It is a culmination of our Jomone Center of Excellence. The University of South Wales was awarded last year a Jomone Center of Excellence, which is in fact the dedication for our first day. That is the virtue aspect of our conference. We also were awarded a Jomone Network in EU counterterrorism, where we have 13 different partners, in addition to the University of South Wales, that we will uh, look at in much, much more detail tomorrow, just to mention all the partners. And I think this time I will try to do it without a glitch. Um, we have in the United Kingdom, we have obviously the, United, uh, the, the University of South Wales, we have UE Bristol, we have Cardiff University. In Ireland, we have Dublin City University. We have CDOP in Spain, and Dosto University in Bilbao in Spain. We have the University of Pisa in Italy. We have the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. We have the Egmont Institute in Brussels. We have Augsburg University, a uh, university very dear to my heart because this is where I'm originally from, of course, in Germany. We have Prague Metropolitan University in the Czech Republic. We have the University of Yash in Romania. We have the IDC in Herzliya in Israel, and we have Shanduba University in Tunisia. So I hope I've mentioned every one of them. And if I haven't, please let me know and I will make sure to mention it later. And then on the third day, we will have our uh, conference in terms of EU resilience against hybrid warfare. This is part of a Jean Monnet module that we are collaborating with Swansea University and um, of course, our very dear colleague Chris Doddard, who works now at the university uh, at Swansea University, that is very very important for this particular project. So this is just a little overview of the three events that are awaiting you, and that I hope that you enjoy this very very much. Just to um, some very brief comments about the entire area, because of course, this has been an area that increasingly you see more and more events being held and of course the European Union has a lot more activity in this particular area. So I thought I'll start with a five minute review of all the things that have happened over the last couple of years and uh, invariably I won't be able to mention all of them but just to give us a little outline of what we are to expect over the whole day today when we look at the area of freedom, security and justice in more detail. The area of freedom, security and justice of course started off as an area that was outside the framework of the European Union for many, many years. It started off as European political cooperation that started with uh, interior ministers in the 1970s agreeing to meet regularly to discuss issues of internal security. They, at the time, did not have a legal mandate, nor did the European community, as it was called then, have competence. It was more of an informal gathering of ministers that in the end became part of the Justice and Home Affairs as it, was, as it was called then later. And of course, also as part of the common foreign security policy that was subsequently also to develop. It was a coordinated action in the fight of uh, against European terrorism and um, that drove initially this particular policy area. And over time, the agenda was increased to also include other issues such as crime, drugs, migration, asylum seekers, borders, and a number of other issues that became more and more important. 
In the 1980s, we then saw the creation of the uh, European Common Market, something that was very um, widely discussed at the very recent G7 summit, as you probably heard all the different discussions that were being held. This is a creation, of course, from the 1980s. That was also then followed up with a number of different EU initiatives, like the Schengen Agreement in the mid 80s that included uh, Germany, France, and the Benelux countries, and that provided for more free movement of people, something that we've also discussed for a number of years. Increasingly, we then developed this area more and more. Schengen became more and more developed, culminating in the creation of the Maastricht Treaty in 1992 that provided for internal competences of the European Union in this area. Now, as a number of scholars, particularly legal scholars, but also myself have argued that, of course, in a way Maastricht was important, but what might be even more important in this area was the treaty that was to come after Maastricht, the Amsterdam Treaty, that provided for what you might call proper EU legal competences in this particular area of just and home affairs. It was also the time that Schengen was first integrated, thoroughly integrated into the framework of the European Union with the kind of opt-outs that the United Kingdom and Ireland were to receive that maybe uh, might be um, you know, something to, to, to be regretted having lost in, in a number of, uh, of years. It also provided for what we call today the area of freedom, security and justice. And in fact, this is the topic of our first day in terms of our discussions that we will have in, in much, much more detail that I hope that we will enjoy uh, very much so. Subsequently, we had, of course, a tremendous amount of activity in particular, uh, with the introduction of the Lisbon Treaty. But of course, even before the Lisbon Treaty, one of the things that kept pushing this particular area in terms of competences is of course, uh, firstly, the, the terror attack of 9-11 and then subsequent terror attacks from uh, Madrid to uh, of course, London and then subsequently then a variety of different terror attacks that we can mention, Paris, Brussels, Berlin, uh, and a number of other terror attacks that could be mentioned. And if I were to mention uh, them all, I, I think I would probably uh, stay here and talk for, for a good bit longer. So I just wanted to give you a brief outline of what we're going to be discussing for the whole day today. But I think at this point, I want to first um, send Professor Sarah Leonard's apologies because she would have wanted to be here and say a couple of words uh, to you as well. But unfortunately, she's lost her voice. She's still hoping. Uh, and I don't uh, mean this in a metaphorical way, she literally uh, cannot be heard right now. So um, I hope that she will be better tomorrow and that you'll be able to hear her tomorrow and she'll be able to continue at the conference tomorrow. But at this point, I'll hand over to Joanna a little bit to introduce both uh, on her own behalf, but also on, on Sarah's behalf, perhaps, um, all of our participants. And, and I'll be looking forward to this fantastic conference. We have such an amazing range of scholars. We have so many people that have registered and I will leave the statistics to Joanna to mention just mm -hmm. to thank with my last words here to the European Commission in particular, the Erasmus Plus program for having uh, accorded us with this great honor to, to present, uh, to, to, to create this event and to really um, carry the flag for the European Union in the United Kingdom also post Brexit and of course also the University of South Wales that has helped us so much in terms of putting this fantastic event together and of course all of our partner institutions that we work uh, together with and that we are so uh, thankful and grateful for for giving their time and their effort and, and, and being a part of this wonderful endeavor that I'm really looking forward to so at this point I will stop and I will hand over to Joanna. Thank you. Hello, good morning to you all. So um, I'm Joanna Desbreda. You have received a lot of emails from me, unfortunately, for over the last two weeks. Um, the numbers are uh, quite impressive. Um, and this follows uh, the success of our last uh, event. And as Christian said, um, 
as we were awarded three uh, Jamonets, um, we decided to celebrate um, this fact with three different events separated in three different days. Um, I would like to mention uh, that amongst um, uh, the institutions, uh, we have um, institutions from all Europe, uh, also from uh, United States, um, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, um, Norway, uh, Australia, uh, and this is quite amazing in terms of participation. So we have uh, 60 institutions uh, participating, and we have more than 480 participants from all over the world, except Antarctica. I, I guess penguins are not uh, yet excited to participate in conference like this one. Um, I would like to, to welcome you all to the International Center of Policy and Security. And uh, on my behalf and Christians and Sarah's, um, I, I would just uh, wish uh, all uh, a very nice conference. And uh, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to drop me an email. So without uh, further delay, I will hand this to um, Jorit and Elena to open this fantastic first panel uh, on um, asylum and, and EU migration. Thank you for all. Thank you so much uh, to uh, uh, Christian, Sarah and Joanna for an, a, a fantastic organization of this conference. Uh, just uh, so that I know, um, that can I just confirm that I can start the first panel, just in case there will be other uh, participants actually just joining at 9.30, which is the official start time. What would you advise? Sorry to interrupt. I also think Niovi, who would be on this panel, is actually in the list of attendees and not in the list of panel panelists. I don't know if she needs to jump over. Um, open question. <laughs> yes, no, I think that would be great if, if you could put Niovi on the panel. She just she just popped up. Perfect. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm right here. Indeed, uh, I was just writing a message that I couldn't uh, open my camera and participate but yeah good morning uh so as christine said today we will dedicate the day to to virtue to the germany center of excellence and tomorrow we will dedicate the whole day um to the Euro, uh, to the germany uh, to the Euro, uh, Germany uh, network on european counterterrorism. we will have very exciting panels uh on terrorism and resilience also on the new trends um, regarding uh, terrorism financing. Um, also a very, very, very good panel that has, I think it's the most, <laughs> it's the most popular one, at least on Twitter, on gender, um, toxic masculinities uh, and terror. Um, so it will be the last panel. And also a terrorism, uh, a panel on radicalization and recidivism um, that was organized by um, Thomas Renard. Um, that is also uh, very interesting as well. Uh, on the third day, uh, we will dedicate it, as Christian said, to um, a Jamone hybrid module. Um, and we will have also four panels. Um, the first panel uh, will will uh, talk about complexity, nonlinearity, and and contested concepts. We we are receiving uh, two keynote speakers, Sir David Harmon and and Jamie Shi, uh, that led um, one of the NATO divisions here in Brussels uh, for many many years. Also, a very uh, interesting panel on the role of memory and memory wars and how memories um, play a pivotal role uh, on, on hybrid warfare. And the last panel um, will draw attention to the dynamics uh, at the gray zone um, and the new challenges for EU and NATO. I think it's, uh, it's going to be um, very exciting because we have, um, we have panelists from South Korea talking about 
uh, North Korea hybrid warfare, as well as we have uh, one speaker um, addressing um, hybrid warfare in Iran. So I think we have all good motives to, to uh, hang uh, out here for the next three days. Um, I think also this is a, a very good opportunity to students that are looking for uh, new topics for research. Um, so I am also quite excited about the event as well as a whole. As we're currently getting closer to the to nine thirty, maybe um, maybe we can start indeed the, the first panel. Uh, if you're if you're happy with that, that would give us a few extra minutes to uh, you know for questions. Would Absolutely, you, you don't have to restrict your your presentations quite so quite so disciplined. So please do go ahead. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jurat, for the, for the message. Uh, so, hello, everyone, and welcome to the first panel of the virtual conference. The, uh, today, we're, today's panel, at the, the nine o'clock panel, is going to be on uh, EU migration asylum and border management uh, after Lisbon. My name is Helena Faran Karofiko. I'm a Jean Monif uh, chair and associate professor in international relations and criminology at Northumbria University. And it is, uh, you know, it's a huge pleasure to actually be able to actually welcome uh, to, uh, these four speakers that we have today and the discussants as well. So today we have, um, as I mentioned, four speakers. We have Professor Elaine Fahey from City Law School, University of London. We have Professor Florian Trauner from the Free University of Brussels. And we have Dr. Niovi Pavule from the Queen, Mary, from Queen Mary University. Unfortunately, Professor Valeri Bello from Ramon Yul is not able to actually join us today. And we also have, as to discuss this panel and these papers, Professor Jurat Ritma from Leiden University. Um, I just want to uh, mention the uh, usual rules. Uh, Joanna was already very kind to actually circulate them by email, but just as a reminder, um, we speakers usually have 10 minutes, obviously, because uh, Valeria wasn't able to join us today. We have a few more minutes. So, you know, 14, 15 minutes would be absolutely fine if you actually want to actually expand on what you have to say. I would kindly ask the audience to actually uh, just maintain mute while the uh, speakers are, are talking and uh, obviously to put any questions they want on the in the chat box uh, and I will be collecting questions at the end you can also set, tell me the questions orally if you want to at the end um, I will just uh, so without delay I'll just like to uh, introduce the first uh, uh, speaker and uh, that will be uh, Elaine. And so um, I'll just introduce them one by one as they as I give them the floor. So Elaine Fahey is Professor of Law and John Monet Chair in Law and Transatlantic Relations at the Institute for the Study of European Law uh, at the City Law School, uh, University of London. Her research interests span the relationship between EU law and global governance, trade, transatlantic relations, the EU's area of freedom, security and justice, and the study of law between, beyond the state. Her recent publications include, she has a very long list of publications, uh, they include, for instance, an article on future mapping direction of EU law, how do we predict the future of EU law, which was published in 2020 in the Journal of International and Comparative Law, as well as multidisciplinary edited volumes, and I can just think of two recent ones, uh, Framing Conversions with, with the Global Legal Order, the EU and the, and the World, this was published by Hart in 2020, and another one which is called, which is entitled On Brexit, Law, Justices and Injustices by Edward Algar in 2019. So I would like to start by giving the floor to Elaine. Please go ahead. Thanks so, so much, Elaine. Can I just check that you can uh, see and hear me? It's my first day back at work in the actual office and I've never Zoomed here and everything's actually going wrong. But um, it's so lovely. Thank you very much to have this invitation and congratulations to Christian uh, for this extraordinary achievement and for you know, it's, it's really lovely to be part of and also uh, Joanne's and exemplary work and it's a real shame not to get to see uh, Lena and Joris and, and Florian and so on in person and, and all the other panels but um, anyway it's, it's great to, to do this so, so this is um um, I, I've been asked to kind of kick off with some more, slightly more general uh, taking all this. This is a project I've been doing for several years. It's a British Academy funded project. Um, it's not 100% complete. It certainly went over time, um, but it's a project on the rise and fall of international law in the post-Lisbon FSJ in lawmaking cycles. Um, and um, you know, I, I, maybe it's a somewhat useful way to start the day to, to kick off kind of general ideas. You know, what precisely is the state of the AFSJ, how we understand it, and um, 
I'm just checking how to move the slides. Sorry, because this is again not really good at this. Okay, so the, so the project um, has been looking at public international law in the 2009, 2014, and 2014, 2019 legislative cycles, looking at two uh, full legislative cycles of a completely regularized domain. So the AFSJ is this very ordinary, normal part of EU law to, to, to a certain degree. And I only study adopted directives and regulations, not other things. And I'm sure there's, particularly in asylum and immigration, lots of interesting things to say. So we do a small focus on asylum and immigration, but it's not, it's not the exclusive project. So maybe you'll forgive me for the kind of general nature of this, or maybe you'll see it in this context. But I'm, you know, from my background, I'm looking at this, um, at, at the EU as a good global actor. I'm looking at metrics of good, of openness and transparency and lawmaking to international law, to the EU's approach to lawmaking in this newly regularized domain, this newly, you know, this, this complex domain, but of course, a regularized one. And overall, my, my thesis is that there is no uniform narrative on international law, but there's, there's certainly very clear trends that I try to provoke or promote. And overall, the use of international law rose or increased very steadily in the first cycle, uh, but fell rather dramatically in the second cycle post Lisbon. And you may ask, well, what, what did I study? How did I do it? But just you know, not to, to spend too much time on technicalities, but I, I looked at a lot of preambles of legislation as a metric of norm promotion. And there's lots of case law of the Court of Justice about the use of preambles, that preambles you know, do, do not take precedence over substantive provisions, but ultimately they do help us uh, understand the purpose of legislation and the EU is sufficiently transparent to have preambles in its lawmaking is how I, I would argue. So kind of more substantively, I argue that rising international law usage generally bolsters legitimacy, even in, especially in crisis lawmaking. And this is especially so in asylum and immigration law generally, whereas waning international law usage or a fall or a decline appears to show the development of the AFSJ as a booming legislative field. This operationalization of many new autonomous systems, actors, which don't have anything to do with international. It's just about the EU doing something itself, which is not mimicking not downloading international and I think it ties into some very nice uh, literature um, from, from, from others. And in general, the EU is really about using broad public international law in the AFSJ and I've done some work on this, but when I, what I mean by that is that it's generally uh, things that traverse the entire set of chapters of the United Nations or just the oldest and broadest agreements. And in general, there are very few multilateral agreements cited in AFSJ lawmaking where the EU is a signatory. The EU is mostly a sig you know, signatory to a couple of major multilateral agreements, but they're mostly not used in the AFSJ. So for example, the trafficking convention and so on. But, but, but in general, these are, are you know, major multilateral uh, agreements, are major developments in, in the EU's global actionists are not present in the AFSJ overall. It's, it's just a use of generally broad accepted norms. So this is, oops, uh, my, my mapping to Windows doesn't look so good here, but this is generally what the data looks like, looking at the numbers in each cycle, looking at the number of references, and Mac has not cooperated with Windows here, but, uh, um, but there's also, you know, this, I, I would argue, parallels out quite well as to asylum immigration, as I'll try to show, but I don't, as I said, this is not my overall focus, it's just, you know, one specific area. But in general, the, the, um, you know, the, the data suggests that there's a very strong rise in the number of regulations throughout the AFSJ cycles, where there's a, a considerable reduction of member state discretion. And I, I think this ties in well with other work that the Commission generally uses regulations under con conditions of Euroscepticism, but is also not very good at justifying well its choices as to what it does. And in general, regulations overtake directives as the main instrument of the second legislative cycle and are predominantly used to create new autonomous concepts. And they generally, most importantly for my purposes, are used to operationalize the AFSJ without any reference to international law. Okay, so just to give you, you know, a, a snapshot of, of the general themes, I would argue that rising international law uh, usage in the AFSJ is about legitimation, standard setting and innovation, whereas declining international law in the AFSJ is generally about the rise of regulations, the rise of actors or the rise of new systems. I'll try to briefly go through this, um, um, but you know, you know, the, the crisis dimension to all this, and I've done some work with, with Lena and, and others, and this is, is quite important to say, you know, at the very end of the first legislative cycle, um, you know, about half of the EU's AFSJ lawmaking relates to things like asylum, immigration, financial matters, you know, two out of six directors, four out of regulations. 
And you might say, well, that, that sounds a bit dull. But, it, you know, in fact, the EU here is, is really grappling with many complex issues. And its use of international is quite interesting here. I call it stock use or bulking. So on the right hand side, if your eyes are not completely ruined from Zoom times, uh, you might be able to see this is this big chunk of text here, recital four of the external um, surveillance as the borders regulation is a really good example of how the EU seems to deal with crisis. It puts tons and tons of pieces of international law into a, a preamble. So this kind of bulk and concentration of lawmaking for legitimate purposes, legitimation purposes, I would say citing all major international instruments as the law of the sea in this particular context. So this is kind of one example of what I would say the EU does at this particular point in time. A slightly nicer example, although not necessarily <laughs> nicer thing, but um, of, of legitimation standard setting innovation is, is as the Directive of Sexual Abuse and Sexual Exploitation of Children, which is an extraordinary piece of legislation, certainly in my mind, a maximum harmonization directive with really far reaching criminal law penalties. And here we see a UN convention, the rights of the child instrument uses the main external norm, something to which the EU is not a party, the EU is, you know, really has a strategic agenda, which is very strong here, one of the most widely ratified human rights treaties of all time. But of course, there's this very strong link here with securitization, the AFSJ, maximum norm convergence, and, you know, questionable place of subsidiarity here. So, so there's a lot going on in this directive, and I think international law gives us an interesting flavor as to how to understand very complex themes, very far-reaching efforts at lawmaking. I think the EU's trafficking directive, one of the first pieces of criminal law of this cycle is also a very interesting example of the use of international law. We have the, the major UN conventions, the rights of the child, organized crime, the Geneva Convention, all used here. Ultimately, lots of people will tell you the directive is very much watered down. It's much more about security maintenance, less about victims. Um, uh, but of course, it's still a very landmark point in, in, in EU law. And international law gives us a slightly interesting take on how to see these concepts evolved, evolving. I think, though, to my mind, the really interesting story is probably the decline of international law, which I said is about the rise of regulations to develop new actors and agencies. This is particularly so as to third country nationals. And generally, there's an absence of international laws to all such regulations, from the EPPO to the Coast Guard to Eurojust, LISA, ETIAS. You know, it is very unlikely to see any of these things with a link to international law, and they're just wholly autonomous, and the important thing is that they afford less discretion to the member states to implement the AFSJ. Now, you might say, well, especially those who are experts in this field will say, well, no, there's nothing really new about, and, you know, are these really new actors? In fact, many of the actors have evolved over, for example, you know, Frontex as its evolution onwards is, you know, is a 30-year evolution. The Coast Guard is, you know, a very obvious example of this, or the EPPO is a very long, lengthy um, you know, engagement with the member states to get to the point where we are today, the centerpiece of a new system. And I, I argue all of these points are valid temporarily, I've challenged a lot on this, but I think that it still is some kind of operationalization of something which is EU, which is autonomous, which has maybe a medium term, a longer term development, but it's certainly not linked to international law. And it certainly is done through regulations, and it certainly is a reduction of, of member state discretion. Now, there are some caveats to this. The entire operationalization of the AFSJ is not just done through directors. It's mainly done, but I, I show that there are a small number of instances where directors are used. So it's a minor role for the systematization of the AFSJ through, through directors, granting some uh, member state leeway. For example, the uh, European Criminal Records Information System as to third country nationals or an EU emergency travel document system. But this is absolutely the exception. It is absolutely not the rule. It does not mean that directors have been wiped out. But there are interesting questions here about why there is absolutely no international law of any description used in um, these instruments. And, you know, again, I think it, it, the, the point about multiple systems is also important to see the third wave of databases of the AFSJ, um, you know, for, uh, as to surveillance and interoperability is very important to, to, to recognize the instruments are used. It's almost exclusively done through regulations. It's a very significant push to institutionalize the AFSJ, and again, without any reference to international, without any use of directors, and the EU here is not using uh, you know, external legitimacy from international law because they don't need to, right? These are autonomous EU systems. And just maybe it's a, a particularly because of this panel, just to say that you know, in the very first cycle, 
Um, there are you know, very few directors, just seven directors in the first cycle, mainly as to a regular migration using a vast array of legal bases. And there's only you know, 12 references to international. Obviously, we need to, to have some context in this, but it's in general very, um, you know, very broadly accepted norms, such as the Geneva Convention, the Human Rights of the Child, ILO, and so on. Whereas in the second legislative cycle, the number of directors you know, plummets even further. Just two directors um, using a slimmer set of legal bases with no international, as I've just outlined already. So, you know, my conclusions are very much tentative on this project. I've tried to finish this project. It never seems to, 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 to finish itself. But, you know, in general, the, the rise and fall of international law in adopted legislation does give us some indicators of the evolution of the AFSJ here as a field, with regulations really overtaking directives. And of course, especially in asylum and immigration, uh, you know, specialists always tell me that there's, you know, it's much more important to study the things that aren't adopted, right? And I, and I fully subscribe to that. But in general, the use of autonomous concepts, I think, is very interesting just through regulations. Um, and and I, I still would argue that I'm not trying to present a negative picture here. I think there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of evidence here of the EU's good global actionists, just because even in crisis times, the EU is not exclusively. Um, the, you know, the EU has some outward facing dimensions. It does not inhibit or prohibit socialization, to use it in, in kind of Iowa terms. And even in its most responsive international or internal lawmaking to crisis, it still tries to use international law, but it still shows, you know, significant evidence of it evolving independently. So I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elaine. That's excellent, uh, excellent timing as well. Thank you. And uh, I would now like to introduce to you uh, Florian. Uh, Florian Trauner is Professor of International uh, Relations at the Free University of Brussels, where he's also the Director of the Research Centre for Migration, Diversity and Justice, and where he also holds the Jean Monnet Chair Expand. Uh, which uh, means explaining uh, resilience in EU justice and home affairs. Uh, and he's also, he's, he also coordinates the uh, Free University of Brussels Interdisciplinary Centre of Expertise on Migration and Minorities. His research is interested, uh, his research focuses on European integration processes with a focus on EU asylum migration, forcible return and counterterrorism policies, including the linkages between European home affairs policies and foreign affairs uh, slash external relations. Among his a uh, very prolific uh, uh, publication list is, for instance, the Routledge Handbook of Justin Home Affairs Research, which has been co-published, co-edited with uh, Ariadne ripoll servant And uh, where research projects are concerned, he, uh, in addition to his uh, Jean Monnet chair, he currently leads a work package of the Horizon 2020 project Bridges uh, on the production and impact of migration narratives. Florian, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thanks, Joanna, Christian, and Sarah for organizing this great uh, conference. I look forward to many, many panels that are coming, uh, taking place in the coming days. And hello to everyone. I saw in the list of participants very familiar names in our research field, so I'm very uh, happy to be here and engaging with you uh, on this research. A uh, bit of a background to my presentation. Uh, it's a bit less academically driven in this case than a lens presentation because most of my input is based on a policy paper that I co-authored with Olivia Sunderbiers uh, at the European Policy Center. So it's a bit more policy oriented and really looking what's going on uh, with this new pact on migration and asylum that the Commission proposed last September. Uh, and a particular focus on the return, on the concept of return sponsorship, that is a, a key feature uh, of, this, uh, of this whole package that is being presented. My question clearly is, can this work? Will this actually lead to more solidarity among the member states? Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a short presentation. I was just told of 10 minutes, but basically there's two uh, parts. Uh, first, this new idea of flexible, but still mandatory solidarity. It's a, it's a relatively new idea. Before it was much more talk about really mandatory solidarity. This flexibility element was much less in the forefront than it is right now. Uh, and uh, right now member states can choose much more question. Can such an idea work in practice? 
what do member states, what do uh, commission officials and so on think about it for our work for the European Policy Center. We have talked to several of the peoples uh, and made up our minds to what extent this is realistic or not. So basically the, the key point of the commission's pact is that uh, it should become more flexible. As many of you are surely aware, post-migration crisis, the European Union tried to uh, reform the existing asylum laws. They proposed a full package, uh, a key piece of which has been a proposal for a Dublin IV regulation. In the Dublin IV regulation, the EU said we need to have a mandatory quota for asylum seekers in the European Union. It has become a very controversial piece of legislation. Some member states have fiercely opposed it. Hungary uh, uh, organized a national referendum on this issue. So in the end, it was not adopted by the time of the European Parliament elections in 2019. New commission, new parliament came into power uh, and the commission's pact is right now the result of uh, commission internal thinking, saying that this relocation of asylum seekers uh, has to be, you know, uh, softened. Uh, and they came up with this idea of return sponsorship. So return sponsorship is a key idea for all those states saying that uh, the relocation of asylum seekers is unacceptable for whatever reasons, they can focus on the restrictive policies, notably on the return of irregular migrants or rejected asylum seekers. Uh, other elements of this pact, key elements of this pact should be that much more should happen directly uh, at the border. Uh, there should be more accelerated procedure, stronger control, uh, strongly empowered uh, Frontex agencies in particular, uh, and migrants, if found uh, ineligible to stay, should be returned very quickly after they have entered the European Union's territory. Uh, and to make this happening, uh, <clears throat> the EU builds very strongly on cooperation with third countries uh, in the Commission's mind they have worked a lot with positive incentives in the past uh, more money better relations you name it right now there should be also negative conditionalities in case a third country is not willing to cooperate uh, a, a very important element in this context is the use visa policy so let's say if a third country is not returning migrants uh, then uh, a third country is <clears throat> many parts of the population, if not all, may actually get <clears throat> tougher, more restrictive visa conditions to enter the European Union. So there should be really strong pressure on third countries to do more uh, in terms of migration cooperation with the European Union. Give you a concrete example, because sometimes this return sponsorship is difficult to, to really understand what's meant. So there, let's say there's a group of Nigerian migrants in in Sicily, they entered there, they are uh, uh, basically uh, received in the centers financed partly uh, co-run between Italian and the US agencies. They are found to be uneligible, so they should be returned. Belgium says, okay, we act as the sponsor, the return sponsor for this group of migrants. During the whole process, uh, Italy remains responsible basically the you know the issuing of removal orders everything remains with italy uh, and the legal responsibility at least until the very beginning uh, remains with the italian authorities too uh, it's italy actually who comes uh, up with some ideas what could be done you know there should be a newly created position so called a return coordinator within the european commission that is coordinating between border countries and the rest of the European Union and ask what could be done. So Italy could ask Belgium, uh, could you finance an assisted voluntary return program for this particular group of countries uh, of, of migrants that they could be returned? Or if they could ask for uh, the laissez-passer documents for the Nigerian uh, uh, consulates, uh, embassies, so they could uh, do more the document document work that is related to a return fee. In case a return is possible, migrants are returned directly from Italy uh, to Nigeria, possibly with the help of the Frontex agency. If the return is not possible, 
then the, sh the responsibility shifts uh, indeed to Belgium. Uh, and Belgium, after eight months, has to take the group of Nigerians and bring them to Belgium. Uh, they can continue to uh, return them from Belgium to Nigeria, or they can, continue, uh, they can treat it according to national and European law. They can ask for a regularization process. They can have a kind of a toleration regime, you name it. Uh, that's a bit the, the context here. So it's really, it requires a quite intense cooperation between the state in which the migrants are physically located and the state that has taken up this return sponsorship. Uh, a bit uh, more on the background, uh, I briefly mentioned it already, the difficulties to, uh, to come up with a new policy post-migration crisis. Uh, this is even a, a more wider background. You can see in the European Union that the number of asylum applications uh, differs widely. Uh, some member states do receive quite uh, a, a high number. Some member states have very few number of asylum applications. Uh, the blue uh, uh, color is Germany. So Germany in absolute numbers, in particular during the so-called migration crisis received much or the highest numbers. Uh, in, in relative terms, it was Sweden. Uh, but what you can see also in more recent years is that the number of asylum applications in Germany really decreased. You have much more applications right now in France, Spain, Italy is also increasing quite a bit. You have some states that have basically no asylum applications whatsoever. So Hungary, for instance, they had 177,000 during the migration crisis. Last year, they had 150 or so. So it's basically uh, no more, very, very few asylum applications in, in Hungary. So uh, uh, fluctuations are high and the distribution is uneven. And the second context is that this mandatory relocation uh, is very contested. So post-migration crisis in 2015, they made this emergency mandatory relocation. Uh, so this is the the legal commitment that they asked to, de facto the commission asked to, uh, to relocate much fewer uh, migrants than this 98,000. So it was only around 35,000 that they actually thought to relocate. Uh, and from this perspective already, uh, uh, or a big share of this number was relocated. But what you can see is that some member states uh, basically completely uh, uh, were outside these relocation efforts, and some member states did relocate quite a bit. Uh, in you know, you had some states such as Malta again, and, and others that really overfulfilled all uh, their their quota. Uh, and in some states, Hungary, Poland, in this table, Austria, you had very few or no relocation whatsoever. So this return sponsorship should be the the magic solution. Uh, if states don't want to, to work on relocate, then let's give them responsibilities for the return directly uh, from the border states. Uh, what has been the debate so far already? Uh, we can see that the debates on relocation shifted, but the broad patterns remain the same. So for those states that considered a relocation within the European Union, as too intrusive to national sovereignty, uh, the relocation or the transfer of irregular migrants is also too much. Uh, so we have statements such as uh, return sponsorship is a relocation through the back door, uh, and uh, it's in unacceptable. Hungary, again, Poland, they are very outspoken that this is something that they will not uh, accept neither. On the other hand, you have the border states that say eight months is a very long time period. We want to have much quicker action, four months max, uh, and then this return uh, provision should kick in. Uh, another point, uh, what you can see is that the Commission was very much, you know, focusing on bringing all member states on board. Uh, it has allowed a lot of flexibility. Member states can choose nationalities of returnees. They can choose, you know, the exact setups between relocation and return. So it's a lot of flexibility in this sense. Uh, but it's also a lot of possibilities to shirk responsibilities, uh, a lot of ad hoc administrations. Uh, it's easily possible that after eight months, 
uh, estates say, but uh, I'm sure Italy or Greece, they haven't actually tried hard enough to return them. So it's unfair right now that they have to come to my country and so on. So it's, it's, it's challenging to, uh, to balance this uh, flexibility and pre predictability uh, that is required there. Uh, and then uh, migrants as such, uh, shifting irregular migrants, uh, where there is no harmonized return regularization policies in Europe creates new vulnerabilities for them. You have very different policies in Europe. You have states such as Denmark that starts to consider uh, some regions in Syria to be safe. You have other states that have no problem to return uh, Afghan, uh, Afghan migrants back to Afghan, uh, uh, Afghanistan. And in some other states, Afghan migrants are much more protected by court rulings. So all these kind of differences, they do play out. And it's not very clear how this return sponsorship concept fits into this. Uh, and a final uh, uh, really big question mark is about the third countries. Uh, it's, it's challenging to perceive that just a bit more pressure will uh, make the third countries cooperate so much more as the European it's also uncertain that all member states will go along with the plans to rule, uh, to use the visa regime for tougher measures. Think of France and the counterterrorism uh, counter operations in Mali, in the Sahel. Uh, so a state such as France has wider security foreign policy objectives uh, and migration control is important, but in some some key countries of origin, it may not even the, the, the overarching, the, the, the completely dominant one in particular for foreign policy actors. So this is already my last slide. Uh, what we can see is return was framed, was proposed as a missing piece for a pan-European migration management as a solution to find more flexibility, but still more a mandatory help. Everybody has to do something. It's very clearly, as several authors have, have highlighted, that this is a, a real politic approach. The Commission uh, saw that member states, uh, some member states, were so entrenched in their positions that uh, it could not longer insist on on relocation alone. So they went for this return sponsorship. the The risk is indeed that there is a very strong level of politicization, of polarization, that this all the elements that the Commission hoped to go away, that this will not be uh, uh, not, not uh, off the table again. There is a further risk that there's a lot of negotiations, a lot of you know, ad hoc uh, coordination efforts, but the, the outcomes are by far not as satisfactory as the, uh, as the Commission had hoped for. Uh, and uh, it's certainly also different, uh, a difficult concept for the migrants themselves and for the partner states with which the EU seeks to cooperate more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Florian, for an excellent, excellent pre uh, presentation. And I would now like to introduce to you uh, the next, the, our final speaker, uh, uh, Njovi. Uh, Njovi Pavule is a lecturer in migration and security at the School of Law of Queen Mary University of London. Uh, prior to her appointment, she was part-time teacher at the London School of Economics and Political Science and postdoctoral research assistant at Queen Mary University of London. She holds a Bachelor of Law from the University of Athens, uh, which, where she graduated in 2008, an LLM in European Law 2011, and a PhD in Law 2017 from Queen Mary University, uh, from Queen Mary University of London. She's been uh, an invited lecturer at numerous universities, such as the City University of London, University of Thessaloniki, University of Athens, ULB, and has uh, participated as an expert consultant in various projects led by the European Commission, the European Parliament as well, the Fundamental Rights Agency, and the ECRE. Her expertise lies in EU immigration law, EU criminal law and privacy and data protection law. And among her uh, growing list of publications, a uh, very impressive list of publications, uh, I've actually just selected a couple of things. Uh, one of them is a uh, edited volume just came out actually uh, on privacy and surveillance in the digital era, challenges for transatlantic cooperation, European criminal law, which was published by Hart and co-edited with Barsami Mitsilegas. 
And she also, also has a forthcoming monograph exploring the privacy and data protection challenges stemming from the establishment and operation of EU-wide centralized information systems, which will be published by Brill in 2021. So we're all very much looking forward to that. And uh, Novi, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helena, for the uh, kind uh, introduction and congratulations to uh, the organizers of this very interesting conference and thank you very much for the inv invitation. Uh, please allow me to um, share my screen. Okay. Uh, so in uh, today's presentation, what I wanted to do uh, in order to match the purpose of the conference was to take stock of the um, uh, legislative developments in uh, information systems and explain to you what I have found some common characteristics in their development over time, but also to uh, give you a sneak peek of what is coming in the future, because information systems are a moving target as we have already seen throughout the time. Uh, I have prepared a presentation for 10 minutes. I'll try to be as concise as possible. So without further ado, I would like to remind you that at the time that the Lisbon Treaty uh, uh, was adopted, uh, we were still in what I have called the second wave of information systems, where only Eurodac and the Schengen information systems first generation were operational. The Visa information system at the time was um, adopted, but it wasn't still operational. It only started to operations since 2011. Uh, so since then, uh, in the last uh, 12, 13 years, we've seen a booming in, uh, of in the development of information systems that has taken place in numerous ways. The first way uh, it has been through uh, the operationalization of the visa information systems, as I mentioned, and uh, the constant reconfiguration of the Schengen information system, Eurodac, and the visa information system. So we've seen new uh, legal instruments being adopted or are in the process of being adopted uh, where uh, additional functions uh, are being inserted in these operational systems. At the same time, uh, we see that uh, the creation of uh, Sender Information System, Eurodac, and the Visa Information System has also uncovered, at least on paper, um, a series of what have been called informational gaps and have led to what is called the third wave of information systems, where we see new ones are being adopted, the entry access system, ETIAS, and the ECRIS for third country nationals, uh, where we see that progressively a surveillance of movement through information systems has generalized and normalized. And in order to, to show you the expansion of information systems, I just want to show you this puzzle that I have created where we see that different categories of third country nationals are progressively being covered by at least one information system to the extent that once all information systems become operational in the future, there will be literally no third country national who is not going to be covered by at least one information system. So this normalization of surveillance has been coupled by um, a series of other common characteristics underpinning all information systems. Uh, the first one, apart from the expanded scope, is that additional categories of personal data are being inserted. Uh, this has been, have been, of course, informed by the um, by newest uh, technology. So we see that um, fingerprints were introduced uh, first in Europe Product, then in the visa information system, then this was expanded in the same information this system. And we see that uh, fingerprints now have become a banality and almost all information systems will collect uh, either a full set or at least some fingerprints of their country nationals. But we see that even more intrusive technologies are being uh, used. Uh, uh, originally, we see uh, that uh, the visa information system 
and, and uh, the Schengen Information System were to collect photographs. Now, in light of the uh, growing use of facial recognition in the future, we are moving into the use at, in the legislation to facial images. Other intrusive technologies are obviously automated uh, decision making, automated processing of data. This makes sense with the creation of information systems which cover all um, categories of third country nationals then um, the data are going to be used in order to cross-check uh, the systems in order to make decisions on visas and on ATS authorizations. And obviously, perhaps the, the newest and more intrusive way that uh, um, information is going to be used is that they're not going to operate in silos and they're going to operate, they're going to speak to one another. Interoperability uh, is still in the pipeline. It has been adopted uh, and it has a series of uh, different components uh, of which basically create new databases through the back door. Uh, we also see the creation, the opening up of information systems to all the more authorities and EU agencies. For instance, Europol, of which at the beginning had only limited access to some information systems, is progressively having access to, to everyone, to every information system, uh, and for instance, to all uh, alerts uh, contained in the same information system. But also with the European Border and Coast Guard, we see growing interest uh, of uh, the agency to be involved. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in databases, for instance, uh, the case of the ATS is the most prominent one. Um, in these um, characteristics of information systems are underpinned, but what, what we can see a growing blurring of the boundaries between immigration and security. Uh, this has been ongoing already for years. Law enforcement access to immigration systems is the prime example, but uh, in my view, the way that interoperability is going to operate uh, further blurs the boundaries between immigration and security because it streamlines the conditions of law enforcement access access to the system. So we see that immigration and security are further uh, linked together. Also, the fact that um, um, the, the way that the XTCN is going to operate is also another way in which security and immigration are connected. Uh, so far, we had seen how immigration systems are open up for law enforcement. Now, in the, the XTCN marks a paradigm shift whereby a security system is going to be used for immigration purposes. Um, these are the, some common characteristics of information systems that are based on their legislative developments. But uh, what is interesting is what is happening in practice and what we have to can expect in the future for information systems. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the currently operational systems uh, expose a series of data quality problems. So for a series of reasons spanning from uh, the uh, training of border guards to different alphabets that need to be inserted uh, in the system, uh, a series of actors on the basis of empirical data have um, exposed a series of data quality issues with the problem being that there are no sufficient mechanisms for the member states to um, rectify the data, data quality problems. EU LISA, which is the uh, agency responsible for the operational management of information systems, uh, every month does automate the checks, but uh, in reality, member states uh, do not follow up on these, um, uh, only follow up very, uh, on very few of these data quality alerts. Uh, a second problem, and this shows the uneven development of information systems, is that though there are some judicial and extrajudicial remedies, in practice, practice shows that these are utterly uh, ineffective. One reason is uh, the lack of information that uh, third country nationals have about their rights. The second is the lack of means. Uh, and um, yeah, so for all these reasons, we see that uh, a, the growing development of information system hasn't been calculated by um, a, a, an effective safeguarding of their country nationals data. And this is also reflected in the fact that there is any lack of judicial engagement by the Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights for that matters on information systems. So we see all these new legal instruments, but they are not being uh, a, a subject to any uh, judicial uh, engagement in any way. At the same time, 
we see that there is an indirect approval of processing of biometrics for immigration related purposes. In one case that was unrelated to EU information systems, but uh, it, it evolved around the processing of biometric data by a Dutch a database. Um, and so in this case of ABNP, not only the court indirectly approved the processing of biometrics, but also made, uh, in order to uh, justify that, it made direct reference to uh, the visa information system regulation saying, since uh, an EU legislation is doing that, so can members too. So indirectly, the Court of Justice has approved that, but there is no further, um, in, no further engagement, no further scrutiny by the Court of justice. Um, so what does the future hold for information systems? Um, as I said, there are three information systems currently in the pipeline. Uh, these are expected to be or become operational in the next couple of years. Uh, if any um, if anything, we can learn from countries outside the EU, this uh, development is or it's not going to be a bed of roses. We, we, they are expected to be a series of problems, not least because uh, the entry exit system, which is awaited eagerly, um, it requires the, uh, a series of uh, portal points uh, in all external borders. So it's going to be quite an issue whether this can be indeed um, operationalized very soon. Uh, the implementation of interoperability is also eagerly awaited, uh, uh, but we see already, even though interoperability was only, the interoperability regulations were only adopted uh, two years ago, we see its expansion, the screening Regulation that uh, was adopted, uh, the proposal for a screen regulation that was adopted in September 2020 already sees the possibility of using the notorious Article 20 of interoperability regulations for uh, the screening of third country nationals at the border. And more uh, problematically, we also see that information systems are going to be weaponized for informed policy making. So have it with the possibility of collecting personal data of all third country nationals, uh, the newest generation of information systems uh, allows for the creation of all the more statistics with the aim of, uh, of informed policy making. Um, in, in that respect, I have many comments from how the data quality problems may affect affect the correct, the correct uh, the, uh, accuracy of the statistics to the extent to which uh, the statistics can uh, justify further restrictive policies that have already implemented or uh, justify the adoption of newest, uh, new, more restrictive ones. Uh, the final issue, uh, as if this picture is not uh, dystopian enough, is how artificial intelligence is going to play a role in information systems in the future. We see already artificial intelligence tools making their way into uh, in, uh, the operational information systems through the ATS algorithms, for instance, how uh, ATS applications are going to be um, processed uh, through the creation of algorithms. Uh, um, uh, these algorithms, we can have a debate as to whether they're going to lead to a possibility to, to possible discriminatory practices. Uh, I already told you that facial images are going are inserted already and are going to be um, inserted all the more in the future with the aim that in the future, when the technology allows, there are going to be facial recognition at the border. Um, the problem with that, uh, from an operational perspective, from an institutional perspective, is that um, we see the pattern that facial recognition uh, technologies are going to be inserted uh, without parliamentary scrutiny. The same had happened with fingerprints, so there was no impact assessment. Uh, the uh, possibility of fingerprints was inserted in the regulations, now facial images will be inserted information systems. And uh, the pattern that is followed is that in the future, when the commission sees it fit, it's going to uh, have a report uh, where it says that the technology is now available for facial recognition. And uh, finally, and with that I will finish, uh, even more intrusive technologies are going to be inserted through intelligence agents and the possibility of having decision on detentions, visas and residence permits through artificial intelligence 
intelligence tools. Um, this is an ongoing project, the artificial intelligence part one. So I can only have tentative uh, uh, expectations, the hypothesis that this is going to further lead to marginalization and discrimination against their country nationals. We see uh, that there are powerlessness uh, in this development of information systems has led not only to the creation of uh, a generalized surveillance of movement, but it will also further lead to even more intrusive technologies against them. So at this point, I will stop. I don't have any solution on these problems. I just paint uh, the dystopian picture. So thank you much for your attention. And I look forward to any comments that you may have. Thank you so much, Niovi, for an absolutely excellent presentation as well. Um, I would now like to uh, introduce uh, our discussant, uh, Jurit Ribma is a professor of European law. Uh, he specializes in the area of freedom, security, and justice, uh, and he works at the Europa Institute of Leiden Law School. He, he holds a Jean Monnet chair on security and mobility in Europe, uh, and Jurit's research focuses on cooperation in just and home affairs, uh, as I mentioned before. He looks in particular at the link between security and mobility and at institutional and technological developments in, in this field. Uh, so clearly he's, he's very well placed to discuss every all the different presentations so far. Uh, he's also one of the directors of the faculty's profile area on uh, interaction between legal systems. Uh, he's responsible for a research project on maritime security and he's a member of the academic uh, executive board of the Research Center for Governance of Migration and Diversity, which was established within the, the framework of the Leiden Delft Erasmus Universities Corporation. Among his recent publications, uh, I've just chosen a couple of them because obviously he's got a very impressive list of publications, is a 2020 uh, special issue uh, of the Maritime Safety and Security Law Journal on the EU and Maritime Security, and the 2020 editorial entitled COVID-19, Another Blow for Schengen for the Maastricht uh, journal of law of European and comparative law. Jurit, uh, we uh, you have the floor. We don't have much concern in terms of time for this panel, so take as long as you'd like. Thank you very much, Elena, and it's great to see you all. It's 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 like one of those reunions, but then online. Um, but I do desperately hope we'll have some uh, some some in real life. So um, I'm in this very luxurious position of, of having uh, been sent two papers in advance and, and the abstract of uh, Niovi, but I know Niovi's work very well uh, and, and I'm always very excited. And I think the papers very nicely illustrate what this, this panel is about. So this panel, the title, uh, Border Asylum and Migration Management Post Lisbon. Um, of course, it's not really Lisbon that is key here in the sense that the, it was the Amsterdam Treaty that communitarized and Europeanized uh, migration border and asylum policies. Um, so, so it wasn't exactly Lisbon that, that changed much. In fact, actually, Lisbon uh, maintained a lot. Uh, we would have expected maybe after, after Lisbon with the, uh, the, the, the then sort of merging of, of the three, uh, two pillars of, of police cooperation and migration and asylum, um, you, you, we could have expected perhaps a, 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 a higher degree of supranationalization, and, and we actually see the contrary, I think. I think Schengen is, is sort of casting its, its intergovernmental shadow over the area. Um, but if we look at the area of migration and asylum, I think what is, what is more relevant, of course, a lot has been going on here because we've had the 2015... <sighs> It's always you always have to be careful with the crisis language, but let's say the refugee crisis, as a, as a, as, a, um, as as that's what it's commonly referred to. Um, we've seen the refugee crisis, and, and what is 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 relevant there, I think, is that already in 2015 we had, of course, the agenda on migration. Then in 2016, following the refugee crisis, we've had, of course, massive activity on the international field with the the EU Turkey deal, um, but also a, a whole range of Commission proposals to sort of um, um, improve and, and, and fix the, the common European asylum system and, 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 and uh, flanking migration policies. That obviously was a, was a disaster. I don't think we can <laughs> call it anything else. And then um, um, post uh, well, post COVID, um, after we, we had dealt with the emergency funds for, for COVID, then the commission found time to finally present its pact on asylum and migration. Because remember, that was the promise with which Commissioner uh, President von der Leyen came in, a, a new fresh start. But the question is, of course, to what extent is this a fresh start? I think the pact, and that was very nicely shown in the piece by Florian, 
is, is very much what I'd like to call drawing table solution. Um, it, it, it's very much wishful thinking. Um, in Florence paper, he, he rightly pointed out that um, um, the pact is being reproached for sort of, uh, um, um, how do they say that, old, old wine in new, in new barrels. Um, um, and that is uh, not true for that return uh, uh, um, uh, sponsorship. That's actually one of the new elements where uh, the commission clearly wanted to reply to uh, um, the, the concerns of the Central and Eastern European member states that have been so much opposing any uh, compulsory uh, reallocation or actually involvement of the European Union throughout. Now, um, let me get to the three papers. I, I think what they very nicely show, they're very different papers in our, our presentations in their own right. And at the same point in time, there, there's clear connections there. And there's themes I think that we've, we've been able to identify pretty much since the emergence of this area, and that is the, the strong focus on the external dimension. Obviously, Elaine's paper is clearly focused on, 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 on the position of international law, but also in Florian's uh, uh, paper, you see that return is highly depending on cooperation of third countries, how conditionality is being brought in. That is also, again, not something new. Um, following the 2016 proposals, there was actually a 2000, now I need to be careful, was it 2017, the new partnership framework? Um, with third countries where already that element of conditionality was brought in. And I think that in the paper, you, you didn't go into that much detail now, but I think in the paper, rightly, you, you ask questions on whether member states are going to be willing to also sacrifice functioning bilateral relations or cooperation in different fields, merely with the, the, the view to, to um, um, enhance returns. So the external dimension is one. And actually, Njovi, also, you didn't mentioned that, but of course, also in the digitalization, the second sort of theme, I would say that the, the brave new border, the, the, the focus on surveillance, obviously there also, there's a very strong element in terms of cooperation with third countries. We see that now in, in, in the establishment of national coordination centers in third countries within the framework of Eurosur. Um, so so there, there, is, there is an incredible push towards this interoperability, but also to uh, increased um, uh, data exchange. And, and I, I very much share your worries there. I'll get back to that. Then, then there's the issue of solidarity. And, and I think that is something that clearly came up also in, 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 in Florian's paper, because yeah, on the one hand, this is sort of to ease the concerns or to basically um, um, reply to the, to the um, opposition of the Central and Eastern European member states. But of course, there's also the element that there's the states at the external border that are demanding more solidarity and more uh, involvement of Europe. Um, so, so the return sponsorship is an example there of that flexible solidarity. And finally, of course, the element of security and the, the consistent sort of um, 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 putting security over human rights concerns. This is never a balancing act, I think, actually. If you put security uh, on the fore, um, it's not that you will get more uh, security by, by, by curtailing human rights. I mean, I, I would assume that I'm preaching to the choir here, but it, it, it never hurts to, to mention that again. Then let me, let me go into the specific papers. Elaine, I, I really uh, liked your paper. It's always very good to do sort of, it's almost non-lawyerly exercise to do some, some data collection and, and draw some conclusions from that. Um, I, I have one question there. Um, you say there's sort of three functions, the legitimation of, uh, of, of EU policies through the use of international law. I would clearly agree with that. I, I would argue that that is, you can, you can broaden that, that, that conclusion and it, 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 it has specific particular relevance for the use of human rights and the references to human rights. Because um, that is something that I noted, apart from, of course, UNCLOS and the Palermo Protocols, many of the international agreements you refer to, especially because we are in the area of, you look specifically at migration and asylum, um, uh, these are human rights instruments. Um, I was, and then your second sort of uh, uh, use of international law was the standard setting and the third one, the downloading. Now with the downloading, I had a bit of a question. I was like, could you say that's that to me, that seems more than just implementing it's it because I would assume that the EU also has based on its international obligations and its external powers also obligations to implement but I would assume downloading is also sort of promoting almost or mainstreaming. Um, 
Now, I was wondering, um, you, you did mention that there was one thing where I, I think you weren't right. You said in the 2011 Frontex regulation, there was no reference to international law instruments, but I do think they do mention the Geneva Convention. Um, that is just a small point, but more generally, I was wondering, could you explain the decline in references, perhaps by an increased use uh, of the charter? And given the fact that many of the, the, the rights that are laid down in the Geneva Convention, uh, prohibition of non refoulement are also in the charter, and you see sort of the court also more and more using the charter. In general, um, I've noticed that sometimes there's no reference to Geneva, but there is to non refoulement So I wonder whether whether that that could be uh, relevant. Um, I was very curious um, to see whether you could also say something, perhaps on the basis of your research, uh, on the substantive potential of these international law instruments. I, I would assume that's more difficult because then you would have to go into content. You may even would have to look at the court. Uh, that would be another paper, but I think it's very interesting to see also what the court does with international law, especially in this area, especially with the Geneva Convention. We have some interesting examples there. Um, but but one of the international law instruments, I'd be I'd be very interested in seeing what its substantive potential is. Is the rights of the child? Um, I think that's underused, and we there is reference to that in the charter as well. Um, I have a question as to your, 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 how you link it to regulations and actors. I, I definitely share your observation that there is more use of regulations, which I think is a little bit naive in a way, because it seems like as if directives aren't binding, uh, as if directives don't, as, as if through directives you wouldn't be able to achieve a degree of uniformity. Um, but then the second point, of course, for actors, for the agencies, and there I see why there's the use of regulations. But there I was wondering, um, and again, maybe for a third paper, there's a whole <laughs> agenda opening up here. These actors themselves are, of course, also international actors. And I think we, 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 this links to my, my issue of informalization, uh, something that you, that you have also identified in your, in your paper. Um, to what extent are these actors also not brought on board in the whole informalization process? Um, Anyway, so, so there's many, many elements in your paper. Uh, I thought it was very interesting. Um, um, wonder, uh, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on that. Then Florian, yeah, the, 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 the solidarity uh, uh, element I, I, and, and, and the intergovernmental shadow of the past, the solidarity forum, I, I, it seems like forum is the, new, is the new working group party or working group or whatever. Um, we now see a Schengen forum being set up um, I think this is very much in reply to the, and I would want to know if you agree, to, to indeed the failure of the relocation decisions and the sort of accepted wisdom now that um, the AFSJ is different from the internal market. Uh, we had a professor, uh, Van Middelaar, in our university saying in his inaugural lecture, uh, migrants aren't codfish. You know, it's easy in the internal market to set quota, but here you're talking with much more um, uh, sensitive issues. Um, I, I wonder how you feel about that. I, I see where he's coming from, but at some point I also wonder, was the internal market that much less controversial back in the day? And, and if so, is, is this non-bindingness, is that going to uh, be the solution? How do you feel about that? Because you yourself also show that this, this whole, um, there's so many open questions and it's so hard, I think, to enforce any of this. And also to, that there's very, um, there's, there seems to be a lack of clear objectives and deadlines and, and quota, et cetera. Um, one of the very important points you mentioned, I think, is that, that issue of mutual recognition of return decisions that is already currently within the framework of Frontex returns operations, very complicated. First of all, you need to have a functioning judiciary, which is already a problem in some of the member states. But secondly, if you make the agency or any other return authority in another member state responsible for the execution of a return decision issued in another member state, you need to be sure that this return decision was issued validly and that you can that you can actually um, um, use that and, and, and accept it. I, I agree with the point you made, and I, I this is my biggest worry, is that with this return sponsorship and the, the, the transfer of people after eight months or four months in terms of crisis to other member states, we're creating a human rights disaster. Um, very much like Dublin, you would have the, the, the transfer of people across Europe. There is no clue, as you pointed out as well, where are these people, what is the position of these people in the, in the member states where they're being transferred to. Mind you, these are people that have already been told you shouldn't be in the European Union. 
Um, what is this going to mean for detention, for their, uh, the protection of their rights in, in those member states that are then responsible for returning them, knowing that so often return is impossible? We have the Mahdi case law that says there's actually, the EU has nothing to say. All the EU obliges member states to do in case of someone who cannot be returned is issue them with a piece of paper saying that that is exactly their status. Um, I was wondering if you maybe can tell me a little bit more, what is the relation between this return sponsorship and the screening procedure at the border and the return border procedure? Are people that are, and, and this is my lacuna, uh, are people subject to the return border procedure excluded from this, this return sponsorship scheme? Or I don't know how that, that, that is gonna work. Um, then, uh, Njovi, I, I think what you said is very interesting, that, and, and I hadn't realized that, that now, where before we've seen migration databases being used for security purposes, it's now becoming the other way around. And, and what I'm very worried about is, is, is this, this whole blurring of the pillars, and you see this also again in the Schengen strategy. Um, um, data all over, um, we see it also in the, in the screening regulation, the proposal for Eurodac, um, um, the sky is the limit. I'm wondering at which point we're actually going to collect DNA of migrants. Um, there's actually now proposals for DNA um, exchange under the Schengen, under that Schengen strategy, a sort of a, a, an enhanced prune. Um, is it only a matter of time before we'll be, we'll be uh, collecting the data, the DNA data of, of migrants? Then with AI, I, I again, um, I, I'm not opposing progress. I'm not that old yet, but I do. I am. I'm, I am very worried about that. Um, also, and this is something because, quite frankly, I don't understand it, and I quite frankly wonder whether the people that are legislating on this are understanding it. Um, this is with regards to AI, but it's more generally. Uh, I have seen close up the negotiations on interoperability, and with all due respect for the for the knowledge of the people at the table. Um, developments, technical, technological developments go so fast and the, um, the, the, the amount of legislation and the amount of proposals, amending proposals, amending proposals that are supposed to amend legislation, I'm not kidding here, it's literally that sequence, makes it so incredibly hard to grasp. And that brings me by the second to the second point. What about feasibility? Is this actually practically feasible? I mean, interoperability, Schengen strategy says, I think 2024 now it should be up and running. Do we know anything on how this is how this is being put into practice? Is this actually working? Are we making progress? And and if so, is 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 this yeah is this is this working? Um, then um, no, I'm going to leave it at that because I, I do think I've spoken quite a bit already, right? Elena, did I do well? <laughs> perfect, absolutely perfect. Now everyone spoke great, you know fantastically within the time so that's absolutely uh, that's excellent and it is quite rare to actually have the, the luxury to be able to actually speak a little bit more than the 10 minutes so it's great thank you so much for this um i would now like to uh, invite uh, uh, members of the uh, uh, of the audience to you can do two things you can either write your questions or your comments on the q a uh, uh, chat area or you can actually raise your hands and i will see you and i will actually give you the floor so before i actually uh, give the floor to the uh, panelists to be able to respond to uh, your uh, comments i would just like to um, ask if anyone has any questions uh, i can see one hand raised, that's Raphael for the moment. So I would uh, like to give the floor directly to Raphael so to actually um, to, you know, ask his questions or comments directly. And I will probably read some of the questions that are already here as well. Raphael? All right, so you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, yeah well, I, I wasn't sure. So I put one question or comment already in the chat that's sort of overlapping. So it basically follows a little bit on what was just said on interoperability and the Schengen strategy, there is more in there, which is even, um, you know, hasn't been mentioned. I think it will kind of occupy us for quite some time. One thing that struck me as, uh, you know, not to make it too long, but I was, I think I follow this kind of stuff. And then I suddenly found this proposal to extend advanced passenger information systems for uh, the EU and third. Where, where the hell is that coming from? And then after digging a bit, I found out that probably, so that's my understanding, it's just guessing, the idea there would be to have a mandatory intra-Schengen uh, 
advanced passenger information uh, network. And, you know, okay, this is all nerdy, but basically it shows another step that, you know, we're not only going to fortify our external borders, but we are also building up internal Schengen inside electronic surveillance networks. And I'm not quite sure yet how that's going to actually be legal in uh, terms of actually the treaty base and so on. So I think there's there's a lot more to be to be said there, but like my comment in the, you don't have to read it out then, in, in relation to interoperability is also, um, thanks Neomi for this uh, oversight, there are so many moving parts, it's always extremely hard to keep track, but I also would make the, uh, or ask you, or my point would be to say, let's also prioritize, and of course entry exit is very important, but the long-term stay visa is so much non-discussed, but in my understanding is happening now, and it's, it's enormous, it's a, it's a gigantic step, and basically we're creating for the first time a central uh, person register in the EU uh, for third country nationals which do have rights under EU law. We're not talking about, you know, rightless or very right limited uh, irregular migrants. So I think that that certainly deserves um, a, a lot more attention um, than, than we've given it uh, so far. Um, so just I will stop also in a moment not to be too long uh, to, to, to Florian. Um, just maybe your guess, you know, I know we don't have a crystal ball, yeah? Um, the pact is in pretty poor shape and we'll see what comes out of it. But how about the guess? My guess would be return sponsorship is already dead on arrival. Um, and it's basically a negotiation mass. So if, if I was somebody, I mean, I'm German, so we want something to happen. Um, my, my proposal would be say, okay, we ditch this in return for, um, and then the question is in return for what? And my sort of guess would be say, okay, Austria and the others who don't want this by no means, um, if, you, if we get rid through relocation through the back door, you have to step up on something else and really kind of minimize your wiggle room on some other fronts. So maybe it's a flexible solidarity plus, I don't know, but maybe you have some ideas on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. I just want to read an, uh, well, two other questions which are here in the chat. Uh, one is also for Florian. It's by Emmanuel Morgado. And he asks, uh, how will it work if all member states opt for return sponsorship instead of returning, relocating asylum seekers? And two, will solidarity prevail among all member states or will it be more realistic to go for reinforced cooperation? Thank you. And then I have a, another one. Uh, which is, I'm uh, not sure if it's, uh, I would like to ask Lewis Jones whether uh, the question that he puts on the chat has already been answered to his satisfaction. Uh, so he had asked, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Nyavi Vavula. Considering how the global wanna cry cyber attack in 2017 revealed how vulnerable our institutions are in cyberspace, how concerned should we be about the integrity and security of EU immigration data, personal data, biometrics, etc., in the face of these cyber threats? Uh, Nyobi has added an, a response here, but he can always say whether you know he's happy with this or whether you would like a, you know additional um, data, additional information. And um, Louis has said it's, he's fine, so that's great. Um, if you have any more questions, please raise your hands. I'll be very, more than happy to give you the floor. And uh, as for the moment we have no further questions, then I'm going to close this first round of questions and let uh, the panelists answer. And I'll probably take things the other way around and I'll give the floor to uh, Nyavi first. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for all these interesting comments and remarks. I, I really don't know where to start from. Perhaps I will start from the issue with the API and its expansion, uh, not least because uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the um, creation of a study towards an impact assessment. So I have a first class knowledge on what is going to happen. So uh, I didn't mention it because my presentation was only focused on information systems, but uh, API data data and its expansion, it's a whole other Pandora's box. Indeed, I fully agree with your comments. Uh, we have argued as experts consulted for this project against any expansion of intra Schengen um, um, surveillance of movement. Uh, the, the project considers not only uh, the use of API intra Schengen, but also the expansion not only uh, to other means of transport from trains to buses. It, it is not always favorable 
approval, but uh, the, the fact that this is even considered and that the fact that the, the Commission has requested the study to expand to any means of transport, both external and internal, intra EU, uh, shows the tendency towards uh, a full generalization of movement, which, uh, and I, I, I didn't mention that, but I think it, it is a, a key issue uh, that is now moving not only uh, to uh, from third country nationals to people on the move. And people on the move are both EU nationals and third country nationals alike. I fully agree with the comment about the rights of third country nationals, and not least because Article 8 of the Charter on the article on the uh, right to uh, personal data protection applies to anyone, irrespective of whether they are from the EU or not. Uh, and uh, therefore is, um, I, I fully agree that the, the, the rights of third-country nationals are not fully protected. Uh, the second strategy uh, mentions uh, the DNA that uh, Yorita states. Uh, in my view, it is still premature to say that the DNA will be collected uh, in relation to third-country nationals. But uh, what we've seen toward, uh, in the development of information systems is a tendency to start small and then grow big as here pass by and when the privacy um, concerns uh, become a bit a bit less pressing so for now we, they like for me the um, how it's called uh, the the seed has already been planted in the second information system to regulation for law enforcement which already enables national authorities to collect DNA for criminals so one information system already allows the processing of DNA data and the seed in my view has already been planted. It may take years before it uh, is being um, uh, transplanted to, uh, to the other branch of the second information system for border management and from there to take over to other information systems. So maybe no, now it's not the, the right time but in my view this will happen for sure uh, in some years. Um, the, the, the technical the technical aspect of information systems uh, and uh, the fragmentation in uh, the development of information systems is also a notorious problem. It is already technical enough on its own, let alone when you have successive reforms of, of the legal basis and new technologies being implemented even before the previous ones have been tested and evaluated. So I, I fully agree that uh, this um, this uh, technical um, techno-solutionism, as it has been uh, discussed and has been framed, uh, is uh, basically makes the, uh, the topic become less and less appealing for scrutiny by scholars, by lawyers, people like every lawyer that is approaching me says, I, I can't understand it, just explain to me in plain words, because lawyers cannot even adv advise uh, a third country national. So for me, it is masking the fundamental rights problem. So by promoting the technical, we lose sight of what is really at stake. And what is at stake is full surveillance of movement, new databases, uh, and uh, blunt disregard to basic human rights uh, standards. And as for the feasibility, the second strategy is quite optimistic as to the um, uh, uh, as to the operationalization of the NTX system and the uh, ETIAS, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the NTX system is in the process of being tested, like there is a pilot. And the pilots have been already implemented in the past by ULISA, according to ULISA, quite successfully. Uh, in my view, uh, the second information system, the second generation, was uh, quite problematic and it took a lot of years to actually being implemented. So that example shows that even new features in an existing uh, database and migration to a larger one is difficult to implement, let alone uh, information systems that will process millions and millions of data, many more than the same information system. We are talking about uh, more than 60 to 80 millions of records. Uh, interoperability is also going to be a major challenge. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and as far as I've seen in reports, there are member states that are really lagging behind in implementation for financial reasons, lack of training, like it, it is too much actually. And a lot of things are going on at the same time 
uh, without uh, um, being followed up uh, by proper evaluations, uh, at, at least in, in, in my view. Uh, so I think that um, I have uh, pictured an even more dystopian future on uh, information system. I try to address all your comments. If there are more, by all means, any forgotten something, just let me know. Thank you so much. You currently have another question waiting for you, but I will pick it up in a second round. So don't worry, I'll come back again. Um, thank you so much. And I'll now give the floor to uh, Florian. Thanks, Elena. Thanks, Jorit, for very thought-provoking comments. Uh, I will ask, or I will seek to respond to your first question by linking it also to the question of Emmanuel, who asks in the chat, how will it work if all members and mentioned the solidarity form and the dynamics there. Uh, I mean, there are two aspects to be kept in mind. The first is that uh, the EU was relatively, the Commission was relatively vague on all the details, uh, and it seems so explicitly so. They wanted to uh, not to bind their hands early on, but to keep uh, quite some room of flexibility for the negotiations. So all the scenarios are not clearly spelled out. What would happen if one thing is there? So this is the one thing. Uh, it's from experience, it's unlikely that everybody will opt for the same. That's what I think the commission is hoping for. You have always had some states that have relocated a considerable amount of asylum seekers. I mean, you had Germany, Sweden, France uh, that went pretty much alone the demands of the commission in the past and the core states, these core states, they seem to be also quite close to the commission's line of thinking right now. Uh, that said, uh, with regard to your question about this non-bindiness, quite interesting for the paper, we also interviewed a few Italian officials and they said uh, the Malta declaration and the Malta cooperation may actually in the end provide more solidarity for them compared to what is in the pact right now, even if it was voluntarily, but it's much more predictable. They always came, so the Malta Declaration is a declaration that has a small group of member states cooperating with Italy every time a boat full of migrants comes to Italian borders, basically, so that you don't have this public struggles about who is taking care of these boats. So this was the reaction to this, and they say it's working relatively well. Uh, member states commit and then they transfer those migrants uh, away from Italy in a relatively quick manner. So right now, by having these additional layers of negotiating or finding an agreement, uh, the outcome for a state such as Italy could be worse than what you have right now, even if there is no legal obligations in it. Uh, that brings, I think, to the uh, second question, and here I link Emmanuel's question to Raphael's point. So the second question is, will the solidarity prevail among all member states? Would it be more realistic to go for reinforced cooperation? And Raphael asks, you know, if the uh, return sponsorship is already dead on the rifle, uh, what could be a, a, a thing to be done? I mean, it's, it's really, it's a difficult question, a very difficult one. Uh, I think politically, it will be very hard for the Commission to, to go away from any mandatory element because it seems it will seem as a too clear victory from states such as uh, Viktor Orban's government, you know, so it's, I think politically, it uh, will be difficult to be sold. Uh, that said, it's also very difficult to imagine that the real outcome will happen, you know, indeed that the return sponsorship, the, the positions are very entrenched already. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not uh, very likely that uh, this will change with any negotiation uh, dynamics. I mean, you could say in a, in a very, sometimes I'm wondering myself, right, we have discussed about the future of the conference, the future of Europe, if not the best would be to relocate the competences in the asylum field to the member states level and simply say that at the EU it didn't work out at all uh, and then see. But then the question is if you can maintain Schengen, if the whole asylum system is renationalized. Uh, but it seems very much that the current system is not, or the member states are not ready to accept the common European asylum system uh, together. I mean, reinforced cooperation 
could be a practical solution. Politically, as I said, uh, it's difficult to see it coming because it could be easily framed as some states bailing out of a common system. And I don't see what they could offer that is equally relevant uh, at the moment. I mean, more border guards, difficult to see. Uh, and then to your question with uh, this return border procedures, uh, I mean, to tell the truth, I haven't seen any details that this would be spelled out. Uh, in principle, the said return sponsorship could concern any groups of returnees in Europe. So they could be even from, you know, from states such as, I think it's even from Belgium to Netherlands, you could also have a kind of a system of return sponsorship in case it's not only border states, center states. So it's very vague. So I think that this group of migrants could theoretically fall into it. But I think if the idea is that some migrants are returned very quickly from the border, then I think it would be primarily the state of the border and the Frontex agency, which is upgrading uh, considerably all the uh, resources dedicated in the return field. So I see more, uh, I see this more as an outcome there. Uh, and then I have a question still on the conditionality and if it had been used uh, externally. Uh, officials often point to the case of Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, there was a threat of a more restrictive visa regime that led Bangladesh a Korean informal return deal. Uh, is, it's often framed as a kind of this model that shows that this policy can work. De facto, if you look at the actual numbers, you can see that this Bangladesh with, with many of the other states, the return numbers didn't increase a lot. Uh, so they agreed on this informal return deal that uh, commits third countries to do more, but de facto, if they actually do more, uh, it's another question. But this is usually as the case uh, mentioned when you talk to, to officials. Thank you so much, Florian. Uh, Elaine? It's, it's a, a huge thanks to, to you for uh, lots of really fantastic uh, comments and I apologize for giving such an academic paper in, in the scheme of things, but um, it, you raised lots of really important points uh, you worth it. I'd love to do them all. I mean, it's, just, it's not possible to do a paper kind of the, the quarter just side of things that's been done and stretched it too far. And I think you're absolutely right. The use of the charter is really being used by the EU institutions to compensate for international law. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's a very different kind of counting exercise. I've tried it's, you know, it looks, quite different to be tracing this. And I suppose maybe just tapping into broader discussions that are taking place here, it, it is of value to my mind to study the fact that there are virtually no more regulations in this field. Assuming everything is done by regulations gets rid of the fact you can't trace you know, the points about Neo is making about a judicial review and so on. You know, how do we trace remedies and rights in a context where they're not supposed to exist, right? This is the, you know, the, the getting rid of judicial review going forward. So I think this is it's quite a disturbing sort of development. Thank you so much for pointing out some errors. I'm sure, I'm sure there's absolutely tons. So um, it's really appreciated to, to point out this. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the, the broader point is about um, you know, how much that you download from international. I think that's a really interesting question in, in the AFSJ, because as you say, you know, the EU is, is very much about promoting international law and this is complicated relationship. So I, I also struggle with that. And I really like that point. I think there's I think, in, in fact, I think there's too much emphasis upon studying downloading from international law, and that's quite complex, right? Because it assumes a chain, as you say, then people get into studying implementation and so on. So it's hard to be general or versus specific, right? So promotion can, can sound very vague. So I tried to, to, to use terminology that could just about matter. But I think assignment immigration is not a great area. I think there's probably better examples in terrorism, counterterrorism and so on of, of downloading. But um, yeah, a really great point. And um, uh, yeah, a really nice point about the, the rights of the child, you can mention the rights of the child as well. I'm really, yeah, I think it's a great example in, in this context, and I'm definitely going to do more work in it. So I've to work so super. Thank you so much. You guys really super with stuff. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'd just like to do a very quick second round of questions. I can see that there's a question by uh, Andrea Ott. Uh, this one is for Njovi. And uh, Njovi, you spoke about ineffective judicial and extrajudicial remedies in regards to the digitalization. Could you provide a concrete example to illustrate your point? And I would like to take advantage of my position as chair to actually add a question, if I may. Uh, it is also for Njovi. And it's relating to the to, to the public-private partnerships that exist in this area specifically. I don't If you don't if you don't know how to answer it uh, that's absolutely fine obviously you didn't you didn't go into this area in your presentation but i was just very curious 
uh, what what has been the role of the of the, uh, the private uh, companies uh, in in pushing for this specific form of techno solutionism and uh, can you see that is it possible to identify whether there's been there's margin within the current process for these companies to shape the final products or not thank you very much um yeah thank you so much for for these uh, questions uh, starting with the first one on effective remedies uh, i i will put on the chat a, a, an article that I, I just published or exactly on this issue and the lack uh, and the ineffectiveness of judicial and extrajudicial remedies in the case of eurodac and uh, empirical research shows that uh, on the extrajudicial remedies uh, there are uh, on the basis of individual rights under the protection law, but these are rarely exercised, uh, like the right to access, the right to correction, the right to deletion of data. Uh, and not only that, but also empirical research shows that uh, asylum seekers and irregular migrants apprehended or uh, irregularly on the border or national territory do not really appreciate and understand the information that is given, which is part of the right to information. So there is the right to information is that asylum seekers should be informed but uh, whether they, the receiving end actually understands the information they receive, uh, it's actually, it shows that this is not the case. So from the extrajudicial remedies, they are not exercised um, rigorously, perhaps for various reasons, not least because they don't really understand what are their rights or they have more important things to be preoccupied. And perhaps that, uh, why, that's one of the reasons why all these policies target and cut nationals because of their powerlessness and the more important preoccupations that they may have. On judicial remedies, that article maps uh, a series of cases from various countries within the European Union where it is shown that um, Eurodac, which is framed as a composite procedure, uh, national judicial authorities rarely uh, and not only judicial administrative authorities rarely challenge the information that they receive from and it's uh, processed and in, collected by other countries. So let's say that there is an error in an Italian registration and the third country national is then moved to, uh, to the Netherlands. We see from a series of cases that rarely the Dutch authorities would challenge what the Italians have done. And uh, this is also reflected in uh, the case law. The judicial authorities are reluctant to challenge uh, neutral trust amongst member states. On the private and public partnership, uh, there has been an article written, if I'm not mistaken, 13 years ago from Dennis Brothers and someone else as well. Uh, I, I don't remember the second author, which is exactly on this um, issue of the greedy um, industry, which uh, saves uh, uh, which, which actually shapes the future of um, information, immigration control. I, I, I fully agree that it is the industry that provides all these new products and informs EU LISA uh, and the Commission. And because of that, this actually frames what will be the future of immigration control. We can discuss it more, but these are my initial comments. I fully subscribe to that argument. It, it's evident that this is the case. Thank you so much. It would be great to discuss this uh, bilaterally at a later stage. And I have a last plan hand by uh, our, our discussant, Jurit. Would you like to come in at this stage? Yeah, sorry, because some of the replies and questions actually um, um, raised some, some new um, uh, questions and, and comments. No, just just one um, question, sorry, one, one additional remark to, to, to Florian. Um, what I found interesting also in the paper, and I forgot to mention, is the, the, the risk of non-cooperation from the countries that would actually benefit from the system because this is an argument that was brought in the cases against the relocation decisions where uh, and it was not accepted by the court but where uh, poland amongst others was saying we're not getting the the cooperation anyway just just a, a point that i forgot to mention but what i was wondering you you said reinforce cooperation i heard this hear this a lot um how do you square that with schengen did i understand your comment correct that that would probably be then the end of schengen as we know it because I, I don't see it otherwise, but this is my view. I, I, I hear a lot about like Schengen, Schengen Plus or, or a small group going ahead, advanced cooperation. I can't square it with Schengen. So I wonder, I wonder how you see that. And maybe in reply to Raphael's comment, um, 
I think it's very interesting what he mentioned in relation to third country nationals that have free movement rights, because that is something where in the commission you see DG Home clash with DG Justice. And it fe I feel sometimes DG Justice also in data protection is sort of on the losing hand. Um, um, but that is something we need, to, we need to bear in mind. Increased surveillance and intra Schengen monitoring will have effects on, as does the PNR exchange, et cetera, on the rights of EU citizens. So these were my sort of last comments, thanks. Thank you. We still have nine minutes left in this panel. And so I'd like to invite uh, panelists to actually uh, give their, you know, last views about uh, or comments uh, about uh, what's just been raised. Um, but maybe we can start if you could always say, you know, in general, even if that nothing has been raised specifically in relation to you, you could always, uh, uh, you know, um, share your, your views. Uh, maybe I can start with uh, uh, Elaine. Um, would you like to add anything else before we come to a close? I don't have anything to add. No, that's, that's absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, Florian? Yeah, um, what you already said, uh, I think implicitly I would agree with him. I think that the asylum and the Schengen questions are very closely interlinked. And if there is really permanently no advance in the asylum field, Schengen will be a kind of, you know, will suffer the consequences as well. And to more closely interlink it has been an idea promoted for quite some time already by some actors such as Macron and others they said, you know, we should make, I mean, they, it seems also relatively logical in principle that you say you have a border free area and within this border free areas, you really cooperate intensively also on, uh, on asylum issues, including relocation, a bit of a, then really like federal systems such as Germany have. Uh, as well. Uh, it seems that politically it's very difficult to go from this right now, what is there with Schengen and uh, to, to, to create these linkages. There have been some papers on this. Um, some other authors wrote exactly the possibilities. And this legally, it's, it's very challenging to do it. Uh, that said, I mean, if politically, uh, you know, it's really. Uh, thought for, I'm sure they could find some ways, but it, it would be really, I mean, it would be a nuclear bomb politically, I think, if you make uh, Schengen there, it, it, the spillovers then for the internal market would be huge. So it's very complicated. I think that's why they also refrain from really going to the bottom of this thing. What they're trying right now is simply to keep migration numbers in relatively lower fields that the, the tensions on Schengen on the asylum fields uh, are not too high. And then they say they can also, with an unreformed policy, they can move forward. Uh, but the question will always be, I mean, the system is not ready for uh, another kind of 2000, 2016 events. Uh, so what will happen if such a things uh, or such events occur, uh, it's really quite open. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, uh, Yavi. Uh, yeah, I, I just one slight comment on what uh, Yuri just mentioned about the impact on EU nationals. Uh, the, it is clear that this is the, the new tendency now that uh, the Guinea pigs have been tested. Now we can move to, to EU nationals and uh, from migration to mobility more generally. Uh, in that respect, I just want to make one final comment on the possibility of like uh, how the TFEU uh, can support uh, such kind of checks. Uh, with the example that uh, was mentioned earlier on the expansion of the visa information systems to long stay visa holders and the use of article uh, 77 paragraph 2b on the checks of the external borders and how this has been used as a possible way to uh, justify the expansion of the visa in an area where arguably, not arguably the, 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 the European Union does not have uh, uh, competence, uh, which is on the issuance of long stay visas, residence permits, and residence cards. So we can see that already uh, there is an expansive interpretation of the TFEU in order to justify further intrusive measures, um, uh, which will affect now also uh, EU citizens. Perfect. Thank you very much. 
And uh, I see that there's no other hands being risen. That I can see that there's no other question in the chat. So I'd like to bring this uh, panel to a close. And I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists, the discussant, obviously, and uh, all the uh, and the audience for actually uh, being uh, very active in actually uh, engaging with this panel, which has been, you know, there's been a fantastic uh, discussion. So thank you very much for everyone. I would just like to uh, mention that the next panel is uh, starting at 11.30 and it's entitled EU Institutions and Agencies Challenges after Lisbon and I will pass on uh, the chair uh, role to Dr. Joana Deus Pereira. Thank you very much and see you throughout the day. Thank you. Bye.